And look, energy sells. When you're in a listing appointment, people obviously, and vendors especially, and buyers as well, they want to have good energy. They want to feel excited throughout the process. They want to have someone that's confident. I'm a very confident person. I know what I can do. And obviously, confidence. As a young agent, a lot of people think, you know, I have to start off with 10 listings or 20 listings. You just have to start off with one. One listing, and I proved it, 5B Ohio Place, and I leveraged that into over 30 duplexes, and then all of a sudden, you've got a market share, and then all of a sudden, you're all getting called in. You are listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. Each episode, we bring you the best minds in business and real estate to help you list more, sell more, and elevate your results. To connect with all things Elite Agent, including the latest news, coaching, and features, subscribe at our website, EliteAgent.com. Welcome to another episode of the Elevate Podcast, where we delve into some of the most interesting minds in business and in real estate, or the best tips and strategies for you to implement to elevate your business. I'm Samantha McLean, editor of Elite Agent, and once again joined by Mark Edwards, the publisher of Elite Agent. Hey Sam, how's it going? And also my husband, as yeah. most of you know. <laughs> so I'm often joined by him, but uh, it's back to school. It is. And for this week, I think we've actually got a really exciting guest on the podcast, a guy by the name of Josh Teslin. I think a lot of people probably heard of him, but I'll tell you what, the guy is just the Energizer Bunny. I think you said it a couple of times, didn't you? Yeah, I think I said it in the interview because I kind of, you know, I interviewed him when we came back from holidays and I think I was still feeling a little bit, you know, <laughs> trying to pull myself back into it. You know, he was like the Energizer Bunny and, you know, it's infectious. Yeah, I know. Look, so the, he's coming into his third year. Third in, year. Yeah, third yeah. year. First year wrote a million bucks. Second year wrote two million bucks. Yeah. Guess what his target is for this year. Yeah. Yeah, the old three million. The guy just has got a memory like Rain Man. And for addresses. Yeah. yeah and you, you wait till you hear this. He can rattle off addresses like... And he's got some amazing tips as well. You know, so one of the exciting things we've got about this podcast is that we get a lot of really experienced agents on and some people that have been in the industry for a long, long time. Josh is, uh, is new on the block. He made himself a niche. And, you know, so if I think within this podcast itself... You can really understand that whole star principle uh, as in, Mm. you know, sort of create a niche within a market that when you look on the surface, all the odds were stacked against him. With the new guys, what I really like to do is I really like to kind of dig in to see how they got their first listing because that's obviously, that's hurdle number one. When you're new in real estate, how do you get your first listing? And also for new guys, when you're competing with established agents who have got an established market share, you really got to do some serious legwork to say well, this is why you should choose me. But when I dug into it with Josh, interestingly, you know, he got his first listing, which was a duplex. Mm. And then from then on, he really marketed himself well to Mm. people that had duplexes because he got an amazing price for this first duplex that he sold. Mm. And then he became the duplex guy, which is, I mean, in look in a place like Quakers Hill, there's a lot of duplexes, right? That's not a bad niche to be in. Yeah. That for him, it's actually naturally progressed into townhouses and then into other multi-dwelling properties. Look, it's a really interesting podcast. Yeah, so hats off for actually sort of uncovering a number of idiosyncrasies as as to how he does business in his area. Well, I'll tell you one thing that he told me off camera. Off camera. Off camera. Off audio. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he showed me actually. Like, you know, because I asked him what CRM system he was using and stuff like that. And he picked up his phone and he actually does a lot of his keeping in touch via text. Really? So he's actually, you know, in his phone, Yeah. he's got all of his, his contacts, his farm area listed in his phone. Wow. Yeah, and he's constantly updating them about prices on duplexes in yep. the area and things yep. like that. And and I sort of thought, well, wow, this is why people want to talk to him. He's not only doing all the markets updates and stuff like that, the social media stuff, all the rest of it, but he is really sort of constantly sending valuable information out to his farm area. So that was something he didn't say to me on the podcast. So mm. sorry, Josh, I've just revealed your secret. <laughs> <laughs> Look, speaking um, of valuable information, I was you know sort of obviously listening to this podcast as it was going on, and the guy was rattling off so much information. I think we've captured all of it in the action guide Tried or as to. much as we possibly could. <laughs> Try to. So the action guide will be available for a couple of weeks. Go into the vault and uh, if you want to access that uh, after it's gone off, then become an extra member, which is now going to be an extra slash pro member. Well, that's right. We've combined the two memberships. So $15 a month, you get access to all of our best digital resources, all. extra, all the stuff in the vault. And the magazine coming to your door as well. It's definitely so much something to get onto. Absolutely. So if you want to sign up to the new pro membership, where should we go, Sam? EliteAgent.com forward slash pro. That'll give you extra. That'll give you everything to be pro. Everything to be pro. 
on that note, on, on with the, the show. show. Welcome to the podcast, Josh Teslin. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honour. Thank you for travelling in from Quakers Hill, which is, you know, we're in North Sydney, so it's a good up the M, which M? Oh, it? look, I just followed the Navigator. You just followed um, the Navigator. It, it definitely was a few M's, yep. um, a few tolls, but look, we're here, so that's great. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been in real estate for a couple of years now yep. in sales, and mm-hmm. you've definitely made a big splash. Yeah. We wrote a story on you last year, which ended up in our top 10 articles, about how you'd made a million in GCI in your first year. Yep. And in year two, you've doubled that. You've made two million. Two million. Where to now? Where to now? Look, 2020 is definitely a big year, new decade. Um, I'm definitely looking at you know leading the pack from that front. And I suppose myself as an agent, a lot of agents who write over a million bucks are you know late 20s into their 30s and 40s. Myself, mm-hmm. I'm only 24 years of age. I turned 25 this year. So the goal for 2020 is definitely from a sales perspective. I did the goal for 2019 was over 100. I did 113 last year. The goal for 2020 is over 150. So 160, that's the aim. In terms of GCI, 3 million. I don't think many 20 or 25-year-olds have written $3 million in their third year in sales. So yeah, every year an extra million would be nice. So that's the goal. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we're going to get into a bit of the source on how you did it. Absolutely. But first of all, can you backtrack a little bit? Yep. So how did you get into real estate? So I got into real estate. I uh, I come from a ethnic family and my Background Italian, so I've got two older sisters. Now the expectation being in a you know ethnic family, you know, got to go to university, and I'm the youngest of three. So my two older sisters, one's a journalist and the other one is a HR manager. So mm-hmm. definitely a lot of expectations. They went to uni, they passed, and then I was never really the academic type. I wasn't you know stupid, but yeah smarts and studying just wasn't really my thing. So I went to university and dropped out after probably, I'd say, two or three weeks. The lecturer stood out the front and said, if you're looking at making money, it's not in sport management. And that's the course that I was doing. And then I thought to myself, okay, I'm out. And then I was a little bit of a chubby kid, actually. So then I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to go to the gym, get fit, do something for me. So I took about six months off. And then one day my mum sat me down and she goes, look, my son, he's not going to be a bum. You know, he's going to, uh, he's got to do something with his life. So she printed out the TAFE list. And then we went through. <laughs> each one by one and she goes you're going to have to pick one we're doing something I said "All right, mum so we're going down I saw plumber and I thought no that's not me and then I saw you know accountant I thought that's definitely not me and then we went down we got to real estate and I thought to myself "All right, look you know my parents I suppose if I I go back as well my parents had a very successful furniture shop for many years so they did that for probably 20-25 years I grew up on the trucks I grew up in the shop on Saturdays and Sundays while my parents were selling so I could probably sell like even in this little studio I could sell you the desk all the chairs and everything (laughs) so I thought look it's probably be an easy progression to get into real estate. Then my grandfather, he was a developer, used to do high-rise units. So I thought, I grew up on development side, so I've been in selling and, you know, I'm an out there person. I'm definitely not an introvert. And I thought, let's give real estate a crack. So then I apply. I went to TAFE and I got my full real estate license, certificate for auctioneer's license. And then I thought, look, got to apply for something. And I was under the mentality, like a lot of people see me now with the beard and they think I'm a little bit older. I had no beard once upon a time. And I thought I was definitely too young to be straight into sales. So then I applied for a role. My mum actually applied applied for it online. <laughs> and then as as because I was I was applying for all these roles and no one was taking me seriously. They all said, Oh, you're too young, you're too in we want experience. And I had absolutely no experience. And then um, one day got a call. My mum booked in a, a job interview in Quakers Hill, and I'd never been to Quakers Hill in my life. Like, I'm a Shire boy originally. I come yeah. from Cronulla, Alfords Point, Menai Way. And then I thought to myself, all right. So I went to this job interview, and they offered me the job on the spot. And they were really the only ones that gave me a chance at that point because I'd missed a few job interviews. And they said, we want you to start off in rentals, and then one day, maybe five, six years down the track, you'll be in sales. <laughs> I thought, okay. So then I started in rentals for a little bit and I was leasing out properties nonstop. Like I was, you know, I'd go there because that was the selling component. The admin side, I was I was horrific. Everyone was calling me, my hot water's gone. I didn't know what to do. So then the rentals girls sort of after, I, th- I think, six months said to me, um, look, it's probably not for you. And then luckily my boss was looking for a sales assistant and he said, would you like to come in sales with me? And I said, oh, I'm too young. And he goes, look, you know, I'll teach you the way. So I was probably with him for six months. And then the big start for me was he got injured once because he plays a lot of sports and a range of things and he got injured and then um, he goes, mate, you've got to do my open homes on the Saturday. I thought, okay. And then he had four open homes and I sold all four. And all the vendors were absolutely stoked. And I thought, look, we could be onto something here. And obviously, as your confidence builds over time, and then um, 
probably not many people know this about me. I actually quit real estate, I'd say, for about six months there. I had a massive breakup with my girlfriend at the time. Just wasn't working. And then, uh, yeah, she left me. And then um, I sort of was at a crossroads in my life. I sort of thought to myself, I'm not a sales agent yet. I'm still working for my boss. Am I happy? I've never traveled the world. So I thought like I had a bit of a, not midlife crisis, but like I thought- A young life crisis. A young life crisis. (laughs) That's what you'd call it. And then, um, yeah, left real estate. I said to my boss, it's, you know, at the moment, I'm just not in the right headspace to list and sell. And, you know, I'm still your assistant, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm out. So yeah. I left. And then I went to Europe by myself, booked it. My mum, funny enough, booked it. She, she goes, I've drained your account. She goes, every little bit of money you've got, you've got to go overseas. You've got to get over the girl. You've got to have something different in your life. And I thought, okay. And then I uh, went to Europe. I was there for a couple of months and um, absolute time of my life. Met new people. I was on a Kentucky, had a ball. And then I came back and I thought to myself, oh, what am I going to do? You know, I don't have a job now. You know, the holiday's over, the fun's over, the girls, you know, that's all happened. And, you know, now I'm back to reality. And then funny enough, my boss called me from Australian Real Estate where I currently work. And he said to me, um, Josh, you know, do you want to come back? And I said, and look, before I left, we were an old school agency. We didn't do signboards. We did no personal branding. We did no Facebook. We did no sold stickers. We had not much training. And I said, look, I think if I come back, a couple of things have got to change. I said, right now, we weren't number one in our area. Right now, we hold a market share of over 40% and 35% is mine. However, we were in the area for 35 years, but you know, we weren't the dominant agency. So I said, look, if we do these things that I've thought of and I want to implement. So yeah, I came back to the office and um, we implemented those strategies. And then over a uh, two-month period, we started to see a lot more traction. My Facebook, that was a cut through for me. Like I started to get a lot of business through Facebook. A lot of people were seeing me online and saying, I saw your video. Um, you know, I saw the Vendo testimonial that you put up. I've seen the community work that you're doing. I started to gain a lot more traction. And then, you know, two years later, 2000 and, uh, three years later now, yeah, 2017, I did that. I won the agent of the year for my suburb. I sold, I think that year it was 38 houses. Um, and then my second, and then my first full year, I sold 71. And last year, I sold 113. And now uh, here we are. It's, it's been a good start to 2020. I've already sold 15 in uh, what date are we now? 23rd. So going well. Yeah, going well. Tell me about your very first listing because yeah. you've got a lot of followers who are also agents, young yep. agents. So Absolutely. how did you manage to secure your first listing on your own? What was that like? I'll tell you. So it was a call in, it was a duplex in Quakers Hill. It was 5B. Ohio place. And in my office, we had core areas and my core areas weren't Quaker Hill. But funny enough, my boss was injured again, second time, gets injured, <laughs> gets injured a lot. And, you know, myself, you know, right place, right time. They called into the office and said, we're looking at selling. We need a sales agent. You know, we're looking to move to the central coast. I said, okay. And I've told this story a few times and um, it really resonates with me. I drive by the street almost every day and it's sort of you know, a bit nostalgic. And I say to myself, you know, that's where it all started for me. Yeah. So yeah, first sale was 5B Ohio place. I went there, sat down and she was a lovely uh, English lady called Teresa, Teresa McDonald and uh, and David. David wasn't there at the time. And then uh, we're talking about price. And I said to her, what are you hoping to achieve? I said, I'm obviously a positive, optimistic agent. And she said to me, um, look, I'm hoping for 750. And I said, Teresa, the record is 745,000. I said, but you've got a unique home. And the record was fully renovated and hers wasn't. And I said, look, if you're going to get an outstanding result. You've got to have outstanding marketing. We started to have all these new marketing. I had my first video, my first signboard, first social media post. And I said to her, if we do these things, I think we're going to, it's the recipe potentially for success. Put it on the market first week. And I had, I think it was 30 or 40 people to the open home and I sold at 785, set the suburb record. Yeah, wow. And then all of a sudden, everyone saw that result and started to say, wow, what a price. Maybe we should give Josh a call. So all of a sudden, the new kid with barely any sales or barely any experience was starting to get call-ins. And what I did strategically as well, I went around to every other duplex and I said, hey, it's Josh. I've just sold the record for 785 The market's good. Would you sell? If I had a buyer for your home off market and I got you the same price or close, would you be happy? And I said, oh, yeah. It's still to this day, it's funny. I've done the statistics. I think I've sold something like 38 duplexes and everyone remembers me from that one. Yep. And it's funny as well. In Ohio, I sold 5B, then I sold 3B later that year, and I've sold across the road 6B. And then off there, you go Alwood Avenue. I sold the duplexes 14A, 14B. And then if you go off Tuna's Place, I sold in there recently number 5A. So all the duplexes, 21A, Pagoda Crescent, everyone called me for that. And then I started to get a little bit of a run on with duplexes. And then all of a sudden, a duplex is sort of close to a townhouse. Then I started to take over the townhouse market. Yep. And then all of a sudden, people said, Josh is just everywhere. We're going to call him in for our house. And 
and then the houses started. I sold number 27 Sapphire Circuit, sold number 9 Gregson Place, sold number 49 Cashmere Avenue. For me, a big thing with my prospecting is working in the heat and leverage. As soon as I get a result, I let everyone know, hi guys, I just sold this. I had 30 people, 29 people have missed out. Have you thought of selling? If I could get you the result, would you sell? And a lot of my business comes that way because I sold a place in Kellyville Ridge. And then the lady called me and said, Hey, Josh, you've just sold four doors down. I live in Brisbane. What'd you get? I said, 860. And she turned around and she said, Wow, you know, if I got 850, I'd be over the moon. And I said, I had 30 people there. I said, 29 have missed out. And she's signing the agreement right now and sending it back to me. So it's stuff like that where a lot of my business is attraction based, based on results um, and just letting everyone know. A lot of young agents. When they're competing with established agents yep. in a listing presentation, you'll have to go in with, I've got a lot of energy and yeah. here's my process and I've got a seven-point plan and I've heard yeah. all these different sort of techniques. Yeah. But you never actually had to go through that. It was no. just purely based on- It was based on results. And look, don't don't get me wrong, I've got a lot of energy. I always say to people, if someone's got more energy than me, something's up. You are. You're the energizer bunny. I so, can tell so, you already. Something's up. And look, energy sells. When you're in a listing appointment, people obviously, and vendors especially, and buyers as well, they want to have good energy. They want to feel excited throughout the process. They want to have someone that's confident. I'm a very confident person. I know what I can do. And obviously, confidence. Confidence. As a young agent, a lot of people think, you know, I have to start off with 10 listings or 20 listings. You just have to start off with one, one listing. And I proved it, 5B Ohio Place, and I leveraged that into over 30 duplexes. And then all of a sudden, you've got a market share. And then all of a sudden, you're all getting called in. And then look, with that comes hard work. Like if someone called me, as I said to you before, I'm not a morning person at all. Like <laughs> I'll get into the office at 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock some days, but I'm finishing at 12 p.m. at night, one o'clock at night. So the late hours is where I pick up a lot of my business. People don't want to do them. I don't have that many commitments in my life. So I feel, um, yeah, now's the time to definitely utilize the time. Yeah. So there's a couple of major points of difference that I'm hearing there too. One yeah. is, is that you specialized in duplexes and you became the duplex guy. I did. And I guess what's in that for everyone that might be listening is that, you know, it is useful to specialize. And secondly, like your point of difference is that you're available when the others weren't. Always. So if the others are available in the morning and you're available <laughs> in the evening, that it's, it's always better to have that. Absolutely. That's my time slot. Like people will call me up and say, oh, Josh, you know, I know it's after hours, but, you know, my husband and, and the kids don't go to bed and my husband come back from work at about 8 o'clock. And if I said to them, look on the phone, that's not an issue for me. Yeah. Right now, if I'll be there at 8.30. You guys have dinner and I'll be there just afterwards. Are you happy to do that? Absolutely. And think about it. If I said to you, if you were selling your home and, you know, you had an agent at 8.30 p.m. at night, A, they're showing they're committed. B, they're taking time out of their life to be there. If they're good, they have good energy. Imagine getting the next person in at 8.30 p.m., it's not going to happen. Yeah. So that's why I get a lot of my business. I'm a very good closer as well. When you're in the appointment, you've got to be able to close. No point sitting there, you know, building rapport and sharing stories and four hours blabbing on and then you leave without the signature. You think you've got it and then two weeks later, it's on realestate.com and you've missed it because someone a little bit hungrier or someone just asked the question, are you happy for me to be your agent? They look at each other. He who speaks first loses and they look and say, yep, we're happy. Let's move forward. Bang, straight away. Get the authority and you've got the listing. Yeah. So you were telling me too, like before we actually turn the recording button on, yeah. that you have a bit of a technique there is that you just pull out the pen. I do. Because if you hand someone something, yep. they'll take it Abs from you. It's a natural human reaction. You hand them the pen. I usually say to them, look, I usually go through my listing presentation, go through my stats, go through what I offer in terms of marketing, go through my results, go through a lot of vendor testimonials as well. Yep. Stats, how many I sell in the area, my market share, buyers I've got from other properties. And then I'll say to them, I just look at them and say, look, guys, I've gone through the listing presentation. You guys have said that you're looking to come on the market within the next month. Are you guys happy for me to be your agent? Then I'll pull out my pen and give it to them. And then they'll usually look at each other and say, yep, they'll pull the pen. <laughs> I'll pull out the agency agreement and bang, we got the business. How can people say no to How you? How can that's, people say no? That's what I, I want to know. Big smile, hand them a pen and you got it. All right. The other thing that gave me a big smile, and, and we'll have to put some of this on video, is that, that you have an interesting lining on your jacket. I do. So can you tell us a little bit about the jacket? I do. Shout out to Walcott Street Tailors, Michael and Jake. Funny story, I, I shared it with you. They called me one morning and said, hey, mate, you know, I'm, we're a suit tailor. We'd love to come out to you and, and give you a fitting. I said to myself, all right, came to the office, you know, came in his swifty suit, you know, not looking like Quaker Silk folk at all. And then he sat down and sort of pulled out his luggage case with all these materials. And 
I said to him, what's going to clinch right now if you get the business? I said, I want a custom lining. I want to be different. And I think as an agent, you've got to stand out from the crowd. If you're all the same, people will just choose the cheapest agent. But if you're different and show that, that's where they'll pay the best fees and that's why you'll get chosen. So I said to him, I want to have a custom lining. The first one I did was all my sold by photos from my vendors. And then he goes, so yep, I'll have it in two weeks. I said, all right. Came in two weeks, had all my custom linings with my vendors. And then I would go to listing appointments and I'd take my jacket off on purpose and I'd say to them, look, guys, this is all my vendor photos that I've had, obviously, with clients that I've sold for recently. I said, I can't wait to put you in the jacket. I mean, it would sort of be like at the end of the sale, let's say, hey, all my vendors were like, I want to be in your next jacket. Can you send me a photo? And then every jacket since then, we try and do something different. I've got my agent testimonials. I've got the awards I won. I've got number two in Sydney, number eight in Australia from Rate My Agent. We've got a couple more in the pipeline. So it's something different, a bit quirky. Some people don't like them, but other people do, and that's what I focus on. Yeah, well, I think you know it's another point of difference yep. in your marketing. And no one's uh, doing it. No one's going to forget you. No one will forget me. You've got to be memorable. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk about being memorable in service. Yes. Because you just mentioned Rate My Agent a couple yep. of times, and Absolutely. you've got five-star reviews all around. Is that something that you focused heavily on in the beginning? Absolutely. I think that going into a listing presentation, I'd probably say half my presentation is Rate My Agent and testimonials because anyone can sell a property. Let's say you sell, like last year I sold 113. Not anyone can sell 113, but in terms of you could sell maybe 10 or 20, but it's a whole different category and a whole different conversation if you can have 10 or 20 happy vendors and buyers. And I go into appointments and I suppose for me, being relatively new in the industry, being this is my third full year in sales, a lot of people think, oh, you know, can we trust him? He hasn't got the experience factor. And I'll turn around and say, I sold 113 last year. Here's 113 positive vendor reviews. And I do three types. I'll say to them, here are the written review from Rate My Agent. Here's their mobile number. They've given me consent to pass that on to you. Here's the sold by photo. And here's a video testimonial. And I set it up with my vendors. And I say to them, pre even selling or getting the listing, I'll say to them, if I got you guys a good result, you'd be happy to write me a review. They go, absolutely. And I said, if I got you a shit result, I said, you wouldn't recommend me. They said, Absolutely. So I said, if I get you a good result and you're happy, you'll do me a video testimonial, you'll get a nice photo and you'll write me a review. They go, yep. And I go, beautiful. Even a realestate.com review as well. And I said, absolutely. <laughs> so I sort of, I throw it in there. And then in my listing presentation, I'll say, look, I sold that property down the road. Now, this is what the vendor had to say. This is their video. And this is the photo that we took together. And I'll play the video, 40 seconds of them saying, look, I sold through Josh. Great experience. Referred him to friends. Good energy. Sold the place for a record. If you're selling, call Josh. That builds rapport instantly. Because I don't have, oh, Josh sold my mum's house five years ago. I haven't sold that many. So yeah. in terms of building rapport, that works brilliantly for me. And we're in a service-based industry. You know, anyone, as I said, anyone can sell one property or 20 or 100 properties a year, but it's the service level you give, calling them back, going to the Peston building, you know, giving them feedback. Every day I talk to my vendors whilst they're on the market. They want to know what's happening. It's one of the three most important and stressful things you'll go through in life is selling a house. They want to know what the buyer's like, what they didn't like, what they feel it's worth, what they're comparing to. And that comes through comprehensive feedback. With me, vendor management is huge. I've got a small team. I've only got one assistant. I've got an admin provided by the office and I've got myself. We're doing the numbers of probably a four or five team, wow. but that's a full-on commitment. Like I'm looking to hire eventually sooner to get my numbers up. But yeah, the vendor management's huge and, and service. It's like if you go to a nice restaurant and you have a good meal and they put little, you know, can you write some feedback? What do you rate it out of 10? And if you had a great steak and it was nice mashed potato and good dessert, you'd tick 10, no problem. Same thing with real estate. Yeah, I think what you've done there is really smart and a really great takeaway, I guess, for anyone listening too, is that in Hollywood movies, they foreshadow, you know, the big drama at the end. They do. So, you know, you'll see, you'll see the story sort of wind up and then there'll yeah. be a big drama. Yeah. And so what you're saying is that, um, not that there'll be a big drama, but you're saying yeah. in the beginning, like, yeah. I'm going to ask you for a testimonial because yep. agents do find it hard to ask, particularly when there's so many places you've got to be rated these there, days. Where do you stop? But I, I think the main ones, I like Rate My Agent because it's a foolproof system. You can't fake it. You've got to be in there in the back end. You've got to have the correct email address. You've got to have the correct name and number and it logs you. If you're a fake user, you can't post fake reviews. Right. Ra realestate.com now has started to do it. It's a little bit difficult. I think I've got 53 or something on realestate.com. I think that's the most in Sydney on Rate My my age and I've got 413. Wow. So in terms of numbers, they all work. I think reviews on any platform would be positive. What I would recommend to people, rate my agent number one, because you can win a suburb award. And I always say to people, think about it like this, the Olympics. Who won the 100 metre race in the last three, four Olympics? Who got the gold medal? Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt. Who came second? Don't remember. Exactly. No one remembers number two. 
yeah. people only remember number one. Yeah. So in terms of myself, when I won Quakers Hill Agent of the Year, I'd start to go into appointments and say, look, I won the Agent of the Year for Quakers Hill. No one would even consider anyone else. Now I'm about to win the third one next month, and that's a leverage perspective as well. I'm the number one agent in the area. This is my stats. This is my testimonials. Are you happy for me to be your agent? Where's that pen? Where's that pen? It's in my pocket. <laughs> Where's that pen? Where do I sign? <laughs> exactly. Can I ask you too, like, you know, yep. you've had a lot of five-star reviews. Has there ever been a, a situation where someone's given you less than five stars? Absolutely. What, haven't haven't what, got negative reviews yet thank god yeah four stars uh, i've received that before and and i've asked i've said you might be asking what it was and they said look right now um we thought if we gave you five it wouldn't be believable they said we see all these five reviews we thought we'd mix it up and put four i said look fair enough i said were you happy they said yep i had one it was a tenanted property and unfortunately very hard to get access and i wasn't managing the property so i had to go through the other agent and they said look it was a little bit stressful um, that we had to go through that it wasn't your fault but for the process not you individually we felt it was four and a half stars. So that's all right. And I think that makes it more believable for people because a lot of people see my reviews and they go, oh, they must be fake. They're too well written. You know, you're writing the reviews and making them post it. And I said, that's not the case at all. I said, I can't write the nice reviews that they're saying. It's very hard to talk about yourself that way. Isn't that funny these days that people will find a four and a bit star yeah. review more believable Abs- than a five star They will. Review. And you know what? I remember, rate my agent, I had one. It was for a property. My assistant would kill me for telling this story because I, I remember I was telling it in so many appointments and he's like, why are you telling everyone? around this bloody story. Focus on other ones. <laughs> I remember it was a place I sold in Quakers Hill. And in the heading, I remember I was at dinner with my girlfriend at the time and it said, warning in capitals. I thought, oh my God, I saw the email come through. I said, is this the time I get my first negative review? And then I um, I read out a testimonial. It said, when I first met Josh, he looks like a very overconfident young agent with lots of energy, but not lots of experience. He walked into my house with a flashy suit and tie, and I thought, I'm not going to hire this guy based on his looks. And then he started to talk, and he went through that you should trust me, and they were really happy with the result. They even said the market was down, which obviously was in 2018, 2017, at the end there. And um, he said at the end of the day, he got me a great result in the current market. It wasn't what I wanted. However, he got me moving forward, and for that, I'm thankful. And that review, for me, I because you can boost reviews on Rate My Agent and all the platforms, I think I had something like 125,000 clicks on it. Like yeah. it was ridiculous because people were drawn to warning and they thought, oh, someone said something negative and then it turned into a positive. Yeah. So um, yeah, it is, it's funny how they look at that type of stuff. Yeah. Congratulations. That's a fantastic review. Thanks. Like absolutely. And and fantastic from a marketing point of view. So let's talk marketing. Let's now, talk marketing. Because I know that that's a passion of yours and it, it is. actually is a passion of mine. So yeah. what do you think of the three main things that agents should do in terms of marketing that have really worked for you? Number one, Facebook. Facebook's huge for me. I do a weekly wrap-up every single week. It's a live wrap-up. I've got a little tripod that cost me, I think, 20 bucks from Camera Warehouse. I set it up and I talk about the market. What's on the market? What I've sold? testimonials, reviews, what's coming, exclusives, where I think the market's going. I think I get per week, it's over 20,000 views. Like it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. So from that perspective, Facebook's a big one. Even if you're a new agent, just talk about the market and what it's doing. Even if it's not your results, you don't have to mention addresses. You can just say, look, one sold on this street. It got a fantastic result at auction, keeping it updated. You know, there was four bidders. I attended the auction personally. You know, in the office, we've got a couple of listings coming up. I get probably as well buyers. I'd probably say 50, 60 messages a week just from buyers. Hey, Josh, what's the Facebook exclusive this week? What do you got coming? So, Facebook's a big thing for me. Now, Facebook loves live content. Yep. If you've got live content, the algorithm, it's Facebook organic. So, a lot of people will be drawn more to it because Facebook's putting it out there to more people. And yep. I'm boosting it as well. I'm putting a thousand bucks into that every single week. So, that gets you the views and the reach. And I'm boosting it 24 to 65 plus as an age bracket. And I'm doing it 10 kilometers and surrounding. So, right. what that means is anyone from 10 kilometers and around will get my ad. And then I put the algorithms, real estate, you know, looking to buy, sell, and that's how it's targeting them. Also on Facebook, I believe a post a day will definitely um, keep the bad people away. Yep. So in terms of um, I'm putting up sold by photos, I'm putting up reviews, I'm putting up all my listings, I'm putting up videos. Video gets a lot of views as well. So yeah, that, that's one big thing. Facebook, I probably get five to six listings a month off it. Probably the second one for new agents in terms of marketing, it's the old school stuff. It's letterbox drops. Now for me, letterbox drops, I dropped half a million last year in my suburb, not per 
personally, obviously, I pay someone to do it. But every single property I list, 10,000. Every single property I sell, 10,000. Monthly stats, 10,000. I'm putting review cards. I'm putting how many I sold, how many buyers I met. I'm going absolutely nuts. And imagine if you were in my area, if you're not seeing me on Facebook, if you're not seeing my signboards, if your daughter's not doing my coloring in competition, if you know you haven't seen me on real estate or domain, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're getting my letterbox every day. It's very hard to escape me. So I'd probably say letterbox shops. Another one is in terms of marketing is self-marketing. I think a lot of people, and look, it depends on the brand that you're with. I suppose I'm with a homegrown, family-oriented brand that's not very well-named at all. We're not McGrath. We're not Century 21. We're not Ray White. We're not Star Partners. We're not LJ Hooker. We're very much an individualized, family-owned company. So I suppose when you're pumping the brand, people list with agents, not brands. And I'm proof of that. A lot of people see me doing over 100 sales and think, how does he do it without a brand? They list with the agent. Yeah. Like if in my area, if people were going off brand, I wouldn't even get a call in. I've got all the big boys in my area. So in terms of branding yourself, I do all my sold stickers, my name, you know, listed by Josh Teslin, sold by Josh Teslin. A lot of branding from a personal perspective and start that early because a lot of young agents will think, oh, you know, I want to make money ASAP. I'm going to start listing and selling from day one. Realistically, you'll have one year, probably six to 12 months where you won't make money at all. And people have to accept that early. Rejection's a big thing. But if you brand yourself, you're on Facebook, you're doing the letterbox drops, you're out there talking to the people, you're hitting the expired listings, you're door knocking around listed and sold, you will get traction. Just a couple of tips with Facebook Live, yeah. which has really worked for you. So yes. I imagine just having this chat with you, yep. you would pretty much, what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get, yeah. When you're doing your Facebook Live wrap-ups, you don't mind talking about what other agents are doing no. and you give your point of view on what's happening yeah, in the suburb. Absolutely. A bit of gossip as well. A little bit of gossip, what's going on. You know, yeah. sold this one, this one's coming to the market. It's an exclusive off-market. You know, if you're inquiring about a double story, I've got it coming to the market. Yeah. If you check my Instagram feeds as well, I put them up about three or four days before they go on the portals. So a lot of people, I get messages on Instagram now, hey, Josh, what's this house? You know, I want to get in. I put up cheekily all my listings prior to coming back January 6th. So they were all on my Instagram in December. Probably got about 30 messages. What's this, Josh? Can you get me in early? And I said, look, it's a sneak preview for the buyers, but in January, they are launching. So um, the live videos, we, we keep it high energy. If you're watching, we have a bit of a laugh. They're sort of off the cuff. You know, it's real stuff. You know, it's not anything that we've pre-recorded. It's all stuff that's just us. I do it with my assistant sometimes as well. I like to incorporate him. It's just an update on the market and people will list with the person. I found this. People will list with the person that's got the knowledge in the area. Yeah. Josh knows what's going on. Josh is everywhere. Josh doesn't know his own stock, but others too, and that's important. Yeah, you know what I love about this chat that we're having is that you've just rattled off, you know, about 40 addresses just in the half an uh, hour that look, we've been talking. I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I could name you probably every second house and the owner in my suburb, and we've got over 10,000. Yeah, and that's actually a really good tip for young agents as well yeah. is remember who your people are. and Obsess yourself. Know what went on. Know all the records. Know where – like when I sold 5B Ohio Place, you know, the record was on Olive Lee Street. That was a single story that sold for 745K. The next best would set was 5B, which I sold obviously at 785, and then I sold 3B for 735, and I sold 6B for 582, and then the record at 9A Roxby Grove is 790, which I sold, and then 32A Kennington Avenue was 755, which I sold, and then I sold 14B – Rutledge, the three bed, one bath record, 741, which I sold. So you've got to know your stats. Yeah. And there's another 10 there you go. For, for those of you that are keeping for the people. count. For the people keeping <laughs> count. So let's get on to some advice. Let's. So if you were starting in real estate all over again, mm -hmm. As a new person, what would yep. Josh Teslin do differently? What would Josh Teslin do differently? I would start Facebook earlier. When I first was an assistant, I would have started it then. I would have leveraged a lot off my boss and I wasn't. We just didn't do it. I think I'd, we'd personally brand as well. I think like our old signboards, like they were the old knock in the ground, you know, and I'd have to personally put the sticks in, put the donger, you know, drill them in. It looked like there was bullet holes because it was a hundred, you know, we'd reuse it 50 times <laughs> and, you know, people would kick them down. I'd think long term, I'd, I'd personally brand a lot more. As I said, boosting on Facebook comes out of my pocket. The extra letterbox drops, that comes out of my pocket. I think from where I was to where I am now, I didn't really have a lot of, besides Tom Panos and besides, you know, Lee Woodward and besides all the trainers and other agents that I've mixed with as well, I'd reach out to a lot of other agents earlier. I think that's important. I think high performers, you've got to learn what they're doing. I think it was even last year, like I, I met with all the top operators in all areas. You know, I went, I got invited to Gav's office, had a chat to Gav's guys and I learned off them. Obviously his new office in, um, in Wallara, all the other offices like Ben Pike from Pulse Property Group met up with him, met up with, you know, Peter Chauncey 
multi, a, a lot of different agents. They're all doing different things in different markets. And I thought to myself, if they're doing that and that's working, I can implement it. So learning from other agents, I didn't have a lot of training initially. Personal brand, I would just work hard. I, I, I'm one of those people where I'm extremely determined when you get rejection. Like a lot of people think, oh, he must sign every listing he goes to. You know, he's got the whole market. I go to listings and miss them. I missed one two days ago. Had a message from a lady and I've never lost to this competitor in probably a year. And I said, oh, we're going with them. I thought, okay, look, best of luck. If they don't sell it, give me a call. Just didn't probably click in the appointment. But I just picked back up and yesterday I listed four and today I've got five listing appointments and just get back on the horse. So you've got to have rejection. You've got to fail to learn what went wrong. How can I better myself? And for every listing that I've got now, I've missed in the past. So um, I think just getting in the door and door knocking and having the door slammed in your face as much as possible will build character. And the more character you got, the more better agent you'll become. Yeah, absolutely. I actually recognized you as the Energizer Bunny like a, you. a little while ago. Appreciate do that. you ever have bad days and how do you get yourself out of it? If yeah, you're... all the time. Miss lost of listings. Like I've got a vendor texting me right now that I've got to get back to in a sec. He's saying to me, um, you know, the deal might fall over. They had pest and building issues. What should I do? Those things get you down. Rescissions out of nowhere. Like sometimes you'll hit a record and then all of a sudden they'll rescind. And you think to yourself, oh my God, it was under contract. Everyone saw it was under contract. It's coming back on the market. It doesn't have the same effect. Everyone starts to ask what's wrong. So from that perspective, everyone has down days. You lose listings. Sometimes you just wake up and you don't feel good. Yeah. Sometimes you didn't sleep much the other night. And I think health's a big thing in real estate too. And I, and I appreciate and I look up to sort of Matt Steinway doing the 31 minutes thing. Like that's unreal. Yeah. Like him, you know, getting people into exercise and having a healthy mind, healthy body will definitely help you. Some nights when I am working those late hours, I wake up the next day and I think, oh my God, it's me f- feel like I haven't even had a, a sip of alcohol. And I, sometimes I feel like I'm part hungover. Like I think I'm just so zapped of energy. But what picks me up is you've got to have goals as a young agent. Sometimes you've got to set what you want to do. My first year, I wanted to write a million bucks. I wrote 1.17. Last year, I wanted to write, you know, 1.5. I wrote 2.08 million. Have goals, work hard for it. I want to be the best. I know now is my time. I can't probably do it when I'm 40 or 50. I can't sustain this type of energy and work ethic. So I know now for the next probably 10, 15, 20 years, it's my time to do the numbers, be memorable, inspire others as well. Like once a week on my Instagram and my Facebook, I have all questions, like open forum to everyone. And I'll probably get two, 300 questions a week. Just young agents asking me, what are you doing? What's working? working for you, you know, can you recommend this and, you know, how do you close business and I'll openly, it's funny, all my competitors follow me on all social platforms and I'm literally saying what I'm know, doing to get the business. Well, that's how you ended up on our influencers list. That's it. I, yeah. I, I'll literally tell everyone what I'm doing because I always say you can give someone the recipe but they can't cook it like Josh Tesselin. Yeah. So, I just want to help others as well. A lot of people help me and I just want to give back too. Yeah, absolutely. Any trends or anything like that that you see for 2020? 2020 trends. I think at the moment, January, it's sort of like the gym. It's New Year's resolution. People think New Year, New Me, let's get a gym membership and the gym is, you know, the busiest in January. It sort of tapers off a little bit when the kids go back to school around Feb and then obviously March, it's one of those months where it's a bit steady and then April, it's Easter. Usually around that Easter period, it dips a little bit and then it sort of comes back in May and then it's winter time. It's a little bit cold, so the numbers are a little bit less and then obviously it becomes springtime, which is typically selling season for many and then you've got the end of the year, you've got your October, no November, October, I sold, I think, 14. November, I sold 16. In December, I had a quiet 28 and only sold one. This December, I sold 12. So, the people sort of, it's the last dash until you can buy and people want to have, I've bought a place, let's get in. So, um, even me, I, I fell victim to the the trap of January, got to buy a house. I bought a house last week. Yeah. So, it's one of those things. Yeah, thank you. It's, yeah. one of, it's one of those things where, you know, you just think to yourself, it's a new year, I just want to get in and it's you'd rather do it early than late in the year because a lot of things start and you're back into the swing. So, my predictions for the market, I think after the election, there's a lot more certainty, obviously. Interest rates, they've talked about more rate cuts, which I think is positive for the market. I think right now we've got a shortage of supply with houses. So what that means is you've got too many buyers, not enough houses, which causes urgency. When there's urgency, there's always going to be competition and then the prices are always going to be steady or like even on the weekend, I think I sold five or six, all of them were above the price guide. So I look at that and I think that's a positive sign. Will it last forever? Nothing lasts forever. I think if something happens overseas with the economy, It could go down. But I I always say in all markets, there's never a bad time to sell because if you sell for less, you buy for less. If you sell at the top price, you're going to buy at the top price. You would have been having that conversation a lot last year. A lot, absolutely. Yeah. And I said that when when the market really turned, a lot of a lot of agents got caught, you know, in the beach, and you saw who was swimming naked. So I suppose from my perspective, I was just complete transparency. This is what's going on. This is where it needs to be price wise. The market's here. You're here. If you sell for you know twenty k less where the offer is right now, but you can buy 
buy 20K less, essentially it's the same. And it works out to be better if you're upsizing in that market because you're a lesser price bracket. So 20% for you less and 20% on a million dollar house that's $500,000 more, you're better off. And a lot of people resonated with that and thought to themselves, you know what? It's less than what we want, but we're buying less and long term, we need a bigger house. And people will always sell. There's always upsizes, downsizes. There's the unfortunate things in life which happen. There's the exciting things in life that happen. People move into state, people move overseas. It's, it's all over the place, you know, financial difficulties. So, um, yeah, I think there's never a bad time necessarily to sell. I think now the market's fantastic. My phone's off the hook. People can't stop calling me to sell, which is great because when I established, I made a name for myself in 2017 and that was the toughest market we've seen in a long time. Yeah. Lots of agents closed and agencies, you know, left the industry. For me, I sold 71. That probably was 140 to other people. When I did good in a bad market, I thought when the market turns, this is my time. This is when I'm really going to get the call-ins because Josh worked hard then. Now it's a little bit simpler, but you still have a good process. You still can close business. This is why he's different. We've got to go with Josh Teslin. And that's why now, like this month, I think I've listed 18 already and it's January. So that's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Well, I tell you what, I'm not going to get in the way of closing a couple of deals. That's all right. I want to thank you for sharing so much of your knowledge and your experience, particularly I think it's going to be very helpful for some of our our younger readers. If there was one thing that you would like to leave everyone with or one thing that you'd like everyone to remember as a result of listening to this. Put yourself out there. Don't be scared of rejection. I think a lot of agents are scared to go on Facebook. They're going to be judged. People are going to, oh, what an idiot. You know, he looks like an absolute goose on the screen. Don't be scared to put yourself out there. Be consistent with things. If you're door knocking, and that's a good way of prospecting. There's a hundred ways you can do it. But if you're door knocking, be consistent with things. Don't just do it once. It's like you go to the gym once and expect to have a six pack. But if you go for six months and eat well, it's going to be results. So in terms of be consistent, put yourself out there, ask the question. I practice it in front of my mom, my sisters, everybody, my colleagues. I basically just say, are you happy for me to be your agent? And I smile and I look into the mirror and I say it to myself because consistency, frequency of something with being consistent with it is going to be stuck in your mind. If you don't go to the gym for, you know, six months and you go to a session and try and do what you did six months ago, it won't work. It's the same with listing. Stay sharp, stay consistent, put yourself out there. If you do those things over time, you'll be successful. And listen to your mum. And listen to your mum. (laughs) Mum's the word. (laughs) Absolutely. Josh Teslin, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. To connect with all things Elite Agent, including the latest news, coaching and features, subscribe at our website, EliteAgent.com.